Hey guys, I have another special guest, uh, Professor Noakes uh, from South Africa, a South African scientist, uh, professor of exercise science and sports medicine, author of many books that I have. I'm really excited to talk to you today. So welcome from South Africa. I, I want to first uh, talk about, um, you, you at one point promoted the high carb diets for a while, right? Tell, tell me a little bit while. about, yeah, tell me a little bit about that. And then I think what changed your mind? So I started running in the late 1960s, early 70s, and I started my physiology training in medicine in 1970. And that was the, one of the first years that the new theory arose that muscle glycogen, i.e. carbohydrates in the muscle, was the single, notice the single factor determining athletic performance. Wow. And that's how it was projected to all of us. And so now I'm a young student studying physiology in medicine. And I'm running marathons, and I discover this, and that this is the most exciting piece of information I, I heard in the whole medical training. <laughs> so I was started promoting this high carbohydrate diet in the 19, early 1970s, and I, I then of course adopted that diet, and then I went and did my medical training, completed my medical training, and I was surrounded by cardiologists who were so telling us that if you eat fat, you're going to die. So I was going to eat lots of carbohydrate and it was going to make me run better. Well, in fact, it made me run worse and I got fatter and progressively sicker. And then in 1981, my father was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and he died 10 years later. And eventually I discovered that I also had type 2 diabetes. Wow. And I realized I've got 10 years to sort this problem out or else I'm going to die like he did. And that fortunately forced me to look very seriously into the, what was going on in the evidence. And I came across a book called The New Atkins for, the new, for a New You, written by Drs. Westman, Volick, and Finney. And within two hours of reading that book, I said, oh my gosh, I got it completely wrong for 33 wow. years. Wow. And within two hours, I, changed, I started changing my diet and the results were spectacular. And I haven't looked back for seven and a half years. So that's how it all started. And then initially I was very reluctant to say anything about it because I knew there'd be a backlash and I knew that I would be vilified, but I didn't realize the extent to which I'd be vilified. And so I was very cautious initially, but then eventually it came out and then the problems arose. And then my, fat, my, my colleagues attacked me and that's been seven years of attacks. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I I saw that. That was ridiculous. Um, I want to talk about your. You wrote this book on waterlog, which is fascinating because there's this whole. I don't know. It's like one of those things that everyone knows that you need to drink a lot of water, or drink more water, keep drinking water. Where did this come from? Is it just made up? And so, so that was. It's again. It was industry. Industry brainwashed people to believe, and that's again the problem we have with our nutrition story. Industry brainwashed us to believe certain things which are simply not true. Hey, for those of you who are watching, what we're talking about is when you drink too much water, you're going to dilute certain electrolytes, especially potassium. And um, what's going to happen is you need potassium for the heart to work, to balance fluids in the brain. So if you drink too much water, it's called hyponatremia, right? And uh, your brain can swell. It can really be dangerous. And it can die. And there, right. there have been at least 15 deaths in runners and triathletes and, and particularly in the military, which is really interesting because the, the biggest incidence has been in the military. And they finally, finally, finally this year, so that we described the condition in 1981 and now it's 2018. The first time in, in history, the US military said, if a patient comes in and you think they've got a heat illness and they're confused, you may not give them fluids until you measure their blood sodium concentration. Wow. Now, that, who said that in 1985 or 86? Wow. That's how long it takes for change to occur. So just so you guys know, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Noakes is the, key, the top researcher on this data, exercise-associated hyponatremia. You've done uh, some, some articles on this research a lot, right? Yeah, we were the first to describe it. It occurred in a lady in the 1981 Comrades Marathon, which is a 90-kilometer, 56-mile race in South Africa. 
And she wrote to me after the race because she'd been unconscious for four days. So here she starts this race completely healthy. And then she's unconscious. And she wrote to me a week later or so when she'd regained consciousness. She said, what happened? She wow. said, all I know is my sodium went down. And so then we knew the hyponatremia. And that was the first case. And we collected a whole series of cases. And just by talking to the patients, you could see that they drank a lot. And wow. there was clear evidence that one of them, for example, was a lady with anorexia nervosa who was very sensitive about her weight. And she said, but you know, Prof, I put on four kilograms during this Ironman. And I knew I had to believe her because she would be, you know, she would know what your weight change was. And another guy told me he'd passed like about six liters of urine in recovery. <laughs> so then we were getting wow. an idea. Then we did, a, we did an, an investigation where we hospitalized eight patients with the condition. These people were near death in the Comrades Marathon. And we, recover, we studied them during recovery and we could show that they all passed an excess of urine. And that average, the worst case was a guy who had excreted six liters of extra fluid. So he increased his body weight by six kilograms. Wow. So that was... So then we knew, and we published that paper in the, in the Journal of Applied Physiology, and I thought, well, that's the end. We've proved what causes it. It's going to go away. Well, actually, no, because there were scientists who were being encouraged to say that this was nonsensical research and dehydration is the real problem. And if you tell people to underdrink, they'll all die of dehydration. And that, that was the argument. And industry was driving it. And then the American College of Sports Medicine brought up the new guidelines in 1996, and they said you must drink ahead of thirst, essentially to drink as much as tolerable. That was the ruling, that was the advice. And there's, there's no biology that, that tells you that you must drink to as much as tolerable. Right, so, so we have to drink, drink when we're thirsty, right? That's the common sense type solution. Yeah, absolutely right. correct. And uh, that's how all animals drink, and so why should humans be different, but we, right. Yeah. So um, let's touch on um, this common thing that people, uh, like athletes, that keep asking me, yes, but if I lower my carbs, I'll lower my performance when I'm working out or I'm doing athletic activities. Can you touch on that? Yeah. Okay. I think that we have to realize that 99.9% .9 of everyone of athletes are recreational athletes. And mm -hmm. that's the point. So when we talk about the 0.1% who are competing in the Olympics at short distances, say up to, to five or 10 kilometers. Yes, I think there may well be a role for, for some carbohydrates in them. But for the recreational athletes, really, if you run a minute faster or a minute slower, it's not, that's not important. What's important is your long-term health. And what worries me is that there are a lot of athletes like myself who eat a high carbohydrate diet and then damage themselves for life. And that's the issue. And, and I think actually, uh, most most ultra distance runners, even if they're eating a higher carbohydrate diet, are probably fat adapted because they do a lot of training in a fat deplete in a carbohydrate depleted state. Because if they wouldn't, they couldn't do what they do. Right. They don't, un they don't understand that they are actually significantly fat adapted, okay. even though they're eating or they think they're eating a higher carbohydrate diet. Fascinating. And so you, you tap out the glycogen reserve and then they hit this, sometimes they hit this wall, call it the bonk or something. Correct. And that's when you want to be burning fat. And then if you fat adapted, you can just carry on all day. So you, to answer your first question, if you're probably fat adapted, th you don't need to eat. Um, and, and then the other question I have, um, th there's another concept of um, that if you eat too much fat, people are going to say this, well, aren't I going to, increase my cholesterol, am I gonna die of a heart attack? Can you touch on that point? Yeah, well, I'm glad to oh, you asked that question because I would encourage everyone to go to the Verta Health, V-I-R-T-A Health website. And Verta Health has just completed the first year of a two or three year study in which they fed high fat diets to diabetics. Now, okay, so you get better and 60% put their diabetes into remission. But more importantly, they measured 24 markers of cardiovascular health. 24 mask markers, 23 improved more in the high fat group than in the conventionally treated group eating the high carbohydrate diet. The only difference, only one was cholesterol, the so-called cholesterol. And cholesterol has no predictive value in heart disease anyway. You gotta look at the package. So what they showed, you take the sickest people 
You give them the supposedly the most toxic diet you possibly can, and 23 of 24 markers of cardiovascular disease improve. And the only one that doesn't improve is the one that is, Im is immaterial anyway. So that, to me, that's the kind of the final answer to this, to this problem. Yes, indeed, your cholesterol may go up, but that's probably a good thing rather than a bad thing because everything else is going to improve. So we don't focus on what's not important, focus on all the other stuff, which is important. Yeah, that's right. And just for people that are watching, you have to realize that your body makes cholesterol, makes, I think, 3,000 milligrams a day. So it's a necessary part of our physiology. We need that cellular membranes, hormones, repair, all sorts of things. Exactly. It's probably the most important chemical in the body. And wow. some idiots wanted to try and stop us making it. My great friend, Zoe Harcom, says the liver makes cholesterol. It doesn't want to try to kill you. It's trying to keep you alive. That's why it's making cholesterol. <laughs> And in fact, the first, the way people with type 1 diabetes, where you don't secrete any insulin, they were treated on low carbohydrate diets in the 1920s before insulin was available. And that was the only way you could get people to live any longer was not feeding them carbohydrate. But we kind of forgot that. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that. That's, a, that's interesting. Yeah, it's like, interesting. It's, it's, so um, what type of... Um, interesting uh, activities or research are you currently doing right now in your um, lab or your office? Yeah, I'm, so I'm retired, but we have a foundation, the Noakes Foundation, and we try to fund research. In, and my interest, obviously, is in diabetes. And we're just gearing up now for a study of people who are reversing their diabetes. So over the years, we developed a laboratory where we could study pretty much the whole metabolism of the human body. And we've just added measurements of liver glucose production because that's what really goes wrong in diabetes is you overproduce glucose. So we can now essentially measure everything we need to measure in diabetic patients. So we're taking a large sample of about 40 people with diabetes and we're measuring their metabolism before we put on the intervention, which is a low carbohydrate diet. And then of that 40, we're hoping 60% will reverse. And then we'll see what has changed in that group. So then we'll understand the biology of reversal, which no one has studied yet. So we know that you can reverse. I use that word carefully because you're not really healed. You still can't eat a high carbohydrate diet. So you're in remission in a sense. So we're trying to see what happens with in remission. And we think that we will show that the liver glucose metabolism is normalized, which, which would be crucial. And then that will show, okay, so that's what's the problem in diabetes is that it's the liver glucose production gets, goes wrong, and these are the reasons why that happens. So we're doing intensive research on that. But the other thing that a lot of people ask is, well, if this low-carbohydrate diet's healthy and good, but it's very expensive, and that actually is not true. So the, in South Africa, as in, in the United States, the people who've got the biggest diabetes problem are the poorest because they have the worst food choices. And we've shown that in South Africa, you can, you can live quite well on $3 a day. You can eat well on $3 a day. And we've developed diets for $3 a day. Now we're about to do a major intervention of 200 people where we put them on a $3 a day diet wow. and see what happens. And the, these are people who are sick. They've got diabetes, high blood pressure. And we know that, or oh, sorry, we know, we suspect that once you take the sugar out, because these people are completely sugar addicted and carbohydrate addicted because that's all they can afford to, or they thought that's all they could afford. And so they've eaten those foods for, for decades. And we've known, and we've done at least 10 interventions already. And we show the blood pressure just comes shooting down. Wow. Just like within three weeks, the blood pressure starts to normalize and they don't need their medications. And they start to feel some in control because these are the poorest of the poor who have no control of their lives. And now we've shown them, actually, we can control your medical issues. And it's, it's absolutely eye-opening and it's so rewarding. Wow. So my foundation is funding a major study like that. And then the third thing we do is we have set up a nutrition network just in since May, where we're teaching doctors how to prescribe low-carbohydrate diets and the, wow. the biology of the low-carbohydrate diet. And it's, it's amazing because we believe the doctors are critical. Uh, anyone in the medical profession, be it nurses, physiotherapy, whatever, they're all critical. Because if we can, every doctor we can convert will convert 10,000 people at least because you'll have a big patients and those patients will tell others. 
And just as soon as a doctor says it's okay, then that makes a big difference. Um, one, one question I had about um, when people start to get on a ketogenic diet, they lower their carbs. Um, obviously, you're going to lower the insulin. And if they've been insulin resistant for a long time, occasionally the blood sugars, because they've been held down by the insulin, tends to go up a little bit. Um, have, you, have you seen that? Um, Generally, you know, and I speak from a lot of experience. If, you di if you're frankly diabetic, your glucose control improves dramatically. So at the extremes where people have glucose is going up to 15, 18, 20 in our units. And I'm not quite sure what the American units would be. But within days, they can get the glucose down to, to 80, which would be normal for, for the other values. But we, we talk about values of five. And so the remar it's remarkable when you take a diabetic and put them on the start. But you're quite right. There, is, there can be a small increase initially. Mm -hmm. But generally, that will, that will come, the, the glucose will start dropping in time. Wow. This is awesome. I, I want to just thank you for your time for doing this interview. And I think you shared great insights into what could be possible to improve, improve health and, and the um, kind of counterintuitive uh, viewpoints that are kind of shattering some of the, the myths out there of the mainstream. So I want to thank you for this interview and I hope to talk to you soon with some more updates. So thank you very much. My pleasure, Eric. It was lovely chatting to you. Thanks so much. Great.